Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Hopefully we have some more people joining us um, as we begin. So as most of you know, my name is Derek Noland. I'm a community liaison here at the Behavioral Health and Wellness Program. And um, this webinar today is about electronic nicotine delivery systems or ENDS. Um, I'll be providing an overview on the topic and I'll, let's, I'll explain why we use that term momentarily. Um, so I also want to mention that this um, webinar is, is sponsored by the Tobacco Innovative Grant Funding through the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. And this is the second in uh, four webinars that I'll be doing over the course of this spring. So um, please stay tuned. There will be another one next month. Um, also, this webinar is being recorded so that we can um, ultimately get it up and make it available for those of you who were not able to attend and still want to get the information. So with all that out of the way, I'm going to get into the material and I intend to move through this quick enough so that we do have time for a few questions at the end and um, hopefully even some uh, participation, maybe some, some uh, case study examples. So I think that's everything for now, so let's get started. Okay, the objectives for today's webinar um, will be, again, to provide an overview of electronic nicotine delivery systems, or ENDS. Um, these are your e-cigarettes and, and all the different types of devices that sort of fall under this umbrella. So we'll look to learn more about um, ENDS products. We'll want to understand who uses ENDS and, and the different reasons why people use them. We'll also be considering the health risks and and the potential safety um, concerns and maybe even benefits of ENDS. Uh, we'll also discuss ENDS with that in mind as a cessation or harm reduction method and, and explore the appropriateness of that. We'll learn and practice some messaging around ENDS. And finally, we'll discuss some policy impl implications. Now, obviously, this topic is really um, timely. This is a, a fast-growing concern. Um, the, the Dean of the School of Public Health here has even identified as a, a crisis as it um, relates to, to youth usage, which is, is really our number one concern. Um, and I know it's got a lot of headlines recently. The New York Times um, has, has covered this a good bit. There's, there's even been, um, as some of you are surely aware, some um, mention of Boulder and, and some things near home here and how that's come to play in our own backyard. So. Um, Definitely important topic. So let's start by looking at some of the products themselves. Um, so electronic nicotine delivery systems, or ENDS, are, are here's, here's our kind of coverall definition. They're a battery-powered device that provides inhaled doses of nicotine by delivering a vaporized propylene glycol or nicotine solution. Now we do still have that propylene glycol um, term in the definition at this time, even though some of them do not use that, but the majority do. So that's, that's something to keep an eye on. Um, but you can see here there's three key components. There's the battery that powers the device. There's the vaporizer, which is the means of, of heating the nicotine solution into an aerosol form. And then there's the cartridge, which holds is a holding spot for the nicotine solution. Um, and as I was saying, we use the term in so that there's no ambiguity in the term. If it's an electronic nicotine delivery system, then that's going to cover everything that accomplishes this angle of delivering nicotine through this um, aerosol or, or vapor method. Um, it's worth noting the FDA and CDC most commonly use e-cigarettes or e-cigarette products as their term. Um, but in terms of policy, I think it's best that we use the ENDS term. Um, so these, these type of, um, you know, these atomizer units average about 300 puffs or 30 cigarettes in this sort of baseline example we have here, but that does change as we um, explore some of the other devices that are out there. So um, I want to look back for a moment before we look at the current picture and and, um, and, and as of 2004, there were 466 brands and nearly 8,000 unique flavors on the market. So you can see this really exploded on the scene pretty, pretty quickly. Um, you can see from some of the examples we have here that um, some, of this, uh, some of these marketing materials 
seem to be kid friendly, both in their design and their, their flavorings. And you can see there's a wide range of flavors that, that are available. I've highlighted some of the more interesting or funny ones here. Um, looking back further, uh, amazingly, the first patent for a e-cigarette type device goes all the way back to 1927. Obviously, that looked a lot different than it does now. And there wasn't really much activity for a long time. In the 1990s, we started to see a little bit more movement in this field. Um, but it really wasn't until 2003 that this started to gain more momentum when a, a Beijing uh, pharmacist in China was granted a patent. And from that point on, it started to spread more quickly. In 2007, we were first starting to see them uh, more prominently in the United States and in Europe. And then around 2011, use really started to take off and it hasn't slowed down since. It continues to move pretty quickly as we, as we turn the page into 2018. So here are some basic types of ENDS products. Um, and we've tried to highlight some of the distinguishing factors of the products here. Um, this list is not comprehensive. It, it um, is a very quickly changing field. So we're trying to stay on top of everything that's coming out. Um, you have, you can see on the left, the different types. We have electronic cigarettes or e-cigarettes or, or cigalikes as they're sometimes called um, because they do resemble uh, cigarettes in their physical appearance. Um, they come in disposable or, or refillable, rechargeable units. Uh, they, they often emit a light when, when the user puffs on them so that they know it's working. Uh, th these typically have a shorter, shorter battery life and aren't as efficient nicotine delivery and, and sometimes aren't as potent in terms of the nicotine content. Um, we see many users begin with e-cigarettes. They're, they're, particularly if they're coming to this product from um, cigarettes, traditional cigarettes, that may not be as much the case with younger uh, users who are adapting these, but um, generally it is a place where people start. Um, we also have the vaporizers or vape pens, and, and these have, have really um, taken on a lot of different shapes and sizes. Jewels are becoming extremely popular, especially among youth. I'm, you're, you're probably familiar with those and we will turn our attention to them in coming slides. Um, you can see these vape pens or vaporizers come in a lot of different sizes. They don't necessarily resemble cigarette and, and often don't. Um, they come in disposable or rechargeable forms, often USB charging, for example. Um, they're slim like a pen, so they can be um, pretty discreet and easy to, to hide. Um, they can be modified often as well. And uh, we also have a modified nicotine delivery systems or MODs. These are advanced personal vaporizers. Um, and, and these have become more popular with more experienced users. Um, you, you may have seen YouTube videos where people are doing tricks, blowing um, e-cigarette aerosol and, and things of that nature. Um, there's some ways that you can modify these so, so that you can accomplish what's known as dripping, where you can um, drop the e-juice or the nicotine solution directly on heated coils, and then that allows you to do some of those sort of things. Um, you can see these are larger devices, and they're mostly rechargeable, modifiable, larger batteries, um, and more efficient in nicotine delivery. And also want to note the, the vape pens it varies greatly, but they may be about five to 10 cigarettes um, per, per cartridge. And then lastly, we also have electric, electronic water pipe or hookah. And these are kind of electronic versions of your more traditional water pipe or hookah that are typically a little less efficient. And those aren't, don't seem to be as common, but um, good to know that they're out there. So I've mentioned jewels, and I do want to take a moment to talk about this as they are becoming um, really uh, popular in schools. They really exploded in terms of use last year, even in the fall, especially. Um, they're small USB-like devices that have reusable pods, so they, they really do look like USBs. I, I encourage you to Google Jewels to get a visual image of them. Um, for that reason, they're very easy to conceal and they really um, lack an odor, so um, I, I've even heard that you could be smoking one next to someone, they might not even detect the odor at all. Um, they typically contain pretty high levels of nicotine, which is particularly alarming with, the, with respect to the fact that they're so fast growing in popularity among youth. Um, we're seeing them in middle schools and high schools in Colorado and nationally. 
Um, there's many different youth-friendly flavor options, and um, the jewel industry, uh, while they, you know, they're they're not claiming to be marketing the children, and and technically you can't use them under the age of 18, but even so, um, they're they're very popular. Uh, just this week, there's a a, a new story broke. I, um, I saw it in the New York Times that there's the FDA has launched a sting operation to try to uh, crack down on, on jewels in particular. So they've issued some warning le letters to retailers. It's an undercover sting operation where they're going to be investigating and, and have investigated gas stations and convenience stores and online um, selling points. So, so there is some response to this growing uh, epidemic, but it remains a, a serious growing problem. Um, the reason why uh, e-cigarettes are, are not or ends are not safe is because there are particulates in, in, in aerosol. And we use the term aerosol instead of vapor because it is technically the accurate term because there are actually very small solid particulates that are in the air when someone um, inhales from an ENDS device. It's, it's not merely a liquid solution. There are very small particles. So um, the types of particles that are in ENDS uh, aerosol mixture are influenced by a lot of different factors. Obviously, the device plays a big part of that. Um, the nicotine content and the nicotine solution, um, that, that really drives this especially. Any sort of additives that are in the product for flavoring or, or other use. And the way the user uses, uses the product matters as well. Um, so the contents vary, depends on all these things, the product, the use, amount of time it's used and, and so forth, but they do contain um, these aerosols. So I mentioned propylene glycol and, and glycerol earlier. Um, so there's kind of a misunderstanding here as these are chemicals that are generally recognized as safe by the FDA, but that is strictly in reference to consuming them as, as a, a food or, or a liquid, a, you know, through the digest digestive tract. Um, it's very different, and for example, they're used in foods like ice, ice cream as a kind of a preservative and to lower the, the freezing temperature. But um, we don't really know what happens when they're you know, heated and inhaled. Um, that's a very different thing. Um, so there's unknown safety impacts, but in all likelihood, it's, it's not harmless. Um, we, we know that. Um, and we do see that it can cause eye and respiratory irritation. So um, not, not, although they are FDA approved and you will hear that, that again is for consumption, not for inhalation. So another reason why, and, and really one of the, the, the biggest reason why ENDS are, are still a, a big concern is because they do contain nicotine. And, and nicotine um, has a lot of health risks associated with it, um, with the number one risk being that the person would be more likely to use cigarettes because cigarettes are obviously the most dangerous um, of these substances. But nicotine itself does have health risks. Obviously addiction is, is what I've been getting at. There are some cardiovascular effects um, that, that we need to be aware of. Acute toxicity, toxicity is a little less common. It, it's more possible in ends if someone were to consume the liquid or spill it on themselves. Um, these situations do occur, but they're they're less of a, a concern. They're they're more, while they are a concern, they're they're more, um, you know, the exception in the rule. They're less common. Um, there are de developmental effects to to fetus and maternal exposure, and that that is another one of the big risks of nicotine. It can um, impair development of the fetus, and, and really even in young people, potentially up to age 25 or 26, can still have that impact as their brain's developing. Um, another important note about nicotine is it has a very high capture rate. Um, capture rate's measured on a, a scale of one to four and nicotine ranks at the highest level. Um, and its capture rate is about 33% of, of users will become addicted. And that's twice, roughly twice the level that you see in even um, notorious drugs like methamphetamines and heroin. So, uh, nicotine is very addicting, and that is a big part of our concern um, as we may see people moving to cigarettes. So there are some other compounds and ends aerosols to be aware of. There's some heavy metals, 
um, tin, silver, iron, nickel, cadmium, copper, aluminum, and chromium. At this point, these mostly exist in some of the cheaper products and some of the ones that we see coming from China. They're not as common as they were in some of the um, more advanced products. And these are fine and ultra fine particles, but they still can have a negative impact. Um, we don't know what might happen with long-term use. There's really, uh, this will be a theme throughout this webinar, but we really don't have any good long-term studies. It's uh, going to take time before we can really develop our evidence base. Um, and you can see there's also flavoring compounds that appear to be re related to cytotoxicity. So um, that can play a role as well. Um, as with cigarettes and cigars and, and so forth, um, e-cigarettes or ends do have uh, secondhand emissions. The emissions from the exhalation of the vapor can include nicotine, obviously. Um, those particulates that I mentioned that are in the aerosol uh, mixture. Um, these are also have those potentially toxic or organic chemicals that we just discussed and the heavy metals. Um, so it's similar to cigarettes and, and the way it does um, disperse and so forth. Um, and while the secondhand risk may be lower than the risk of cigarettes, that's not to say that it's safe. And that's also not to say that we have a firm understanding of that at this time. So let's take a moment and look at um, ENDS usage. And so we'll look at some different groups here and I'm gonna pay particular attention to youth in this section. But let's start with adult ENDS users. Um, so, so this graph is, is highlighting the roughly 3.7% of adults who use ENDS every day or, or some days. And that number has, has likely gone up since that um, data has been processed. So th this is the graph of the users. You can see here um, that, that well, a lot of things jump out. You can see that there's 60% are current dual users. So they're not just using ENDS. Um, they're also using cigarettes, and, and that is, is alarming as it's perpetuating that use. And we know that cigarettes are one of the most deadly things that have ever been created. So um, when people tend to keep using them because of the ENDS use, that's kind of um, defeating any uh, sort of cessation benefit that you might hope to achieve. Uh, we can also see that 30% of ENDS users are former smokers. And that means that they had been quit for at least a year. So these are people who had smoked and successfully quit. And um, perhaps, I mean, I'm speculating, but perhaps they thought that ends would be um, less risky. And now they've um, started to adapt that. And, and the real risk is that these former smokers can move into that dual use category. Um, it, it is a concern that we're kind of perpetuating this nicotine addiction. And you can see there that only 11% were never smokers. So if, a smaller proportion of adults are, are picking up ends um, from not having smoked at all. Now let's compare that to the, this next slide, which will look at youth users. So this is 18 to 24. Again, I do wanna add that we see youth um, in middle and high schools. So this is, um, does not capture uh, the kids yet. But um, I think the thing that jumps out here is that that percent of never smokers now jumped from what we saw in the last slide at 11% to now 42%. So 42% of these young people had not smoked cigarettes at all. And um, now they have become, if, if they're regular users, addicted to nicotine and the propensity for them to become dual users is much higher. You can see that uh, dual users already are very high, at essentially the same percentage at 42%. And uh, you can see that it's a much smaller number of former smokers who are, are, have switched to end. So uh, a very small number of people have done that. Um, it, it's also worth noting that um, when we have all these never smokers starting to use these products, we're, we're lowering the stigma attached to smoking and, and e-cigarettes in general. Um, we're normalizing this behavior. And, and we're getting people introduced to nicotine through ENDS, which is a major concern. Um, I also want to note, kind of as a demographic, um, important note at Behavioral Health and Wellness Program, we do obviously a lot of work with behavioral health populations. And it's worth noting that people who have a mental illness are three times more likely to use ENDS in the general population. 
So it's a, another alarming trend that kind of matches what we see in cigarettes. So let's look a little bit more closely at youth ends usage. Um, these statistics are, are pretty fresh. They're um, from the Monitoring the Future 2017 report that was uh, performed by the University of Michigan and sponsored by the National Institutes of Health. Um, you can see here that rates of youth vaping are increasing rapidly. These are the 2017 vaping use rates in the past 30 days. So um, someone who has in the past 30 days uh, been, been using. So just in that time, tiny month time frame, uh, we see 17% among 12th graders, up from 13% in 2016. And in 10th graders, it's 13% as opposed to 12% before. And even as low as 8th grade, we're seeing 7% usage rates. Um, and these do include nicotine and marijuana vaping, as there is the ability to introduce in some of the modifiable, modifiable devices um, some, some marijuana constituent solutions. So there is some crossover there that's important to be aware of. Um, and we, we will be getting some more detailed Colorado data. Uh, CDP is estimating in June, so stay tuned for that. Um, it should provide more insight into what's going on here. Okay, and along with these changes in usage, we're seeing changes in perception among youth. So obviously the perceived risk is is uh, relatively low. Um, it's, it's actually the low, one of the lowest among all, all the different alcohol and drugs. So it's not associated as being a, a great risk. Um, you can see the terminology there has kind of been, been skewed where vaping nicotine is perceived to be safer than e-cigarette use. Um, so there's some, you know, some, some misinformation. Um, I, don't, I don't think that even all well, I, I actually I know that uh, a lot of um, youth users don't even realize that these products do contain nicotine and that they can be addicting. Um, there's also an increased level of acceptance, obviously. There's a, a disapproval of regular use is relatively low compared to most other substances, I, as I've noted. It's becoming more and more normalized in school. Um, this can reduce the stigma of, of all the different um, products that kind of fall under this umbrella like marijuana and, and like regular cigarette use um, kind of by, by being pulled along with this product. Um, likewise, uh, there's a lack of understanding that nicotine in and of itself can um, cause some developmental impact all the way up to the age of about 25. So there's not really an understanding of that. I want to take a quick look at the tobacco industry's role in schools. Um, I don't know if role is the right word, but they've kind of inserted themselves in this position in some ways. Um, tobacco industry-sponsored school-based tobacco prevention programs are ineffective. They, they do not work, and the, 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 the um, evidence bears that out. Um, they may actually promote youth tobacco use just by you know, getting word out about the products and so forth, and they're ultimately intended to promote positive attitudes towards the tobacco industry among young people. Um, and, and, and older people as well. Um, you know, so some of the industries have kind of changed gears recently where they're doing different foundations and, and tobacco-free world focuses and things like that. Um, it's it's uh, pretty hypocritical. If they wanted a tobacco-free world, they could simply stop selling their products. But anyway, uh, school-based tobacco prevention programs are, are most effective when they're comprehensive. So, you know, when they work along with things like like high impact media, raising the prices of products, raising the age to buy cigarettes to 21 is another way, um, incorporating ends in smoke free air laws, not allowing flavored products to be sold that appeal to kids, and, and keeping ends behind counters and locked away where they're sold so that they're easier to get. All these things together can be the most effective ways to try to limit uh, child exposure. So let's consider ends for tobacco cessation for a moment because this is um, a very controversial and interesting topic. I'll, I'll start and probably end by saying that ends are not an FDA approved cessation device. We need a lot more research and um, the FDA has at least begun that process of creating a, a standard um, ends device that can be tested, but it's going to be a long time before we have good evidence about whether or not this is recommended. 
And so that, that's a good quote here that you can see on the slide. While ends may have the potential to benefit established adult smokers, they should not be used by youth and adult non-tobacco users because of the harmful effects of nicotine and other risk exposure. So clearly, we, we don't want people starting to smoke by, by jumping to e-cigarettes. That's, that's not safe. It's not recommended. And while they are most likely safer than cigarettes, we can pretty comfortably say that. Um, that does not mean that they are safe. And it is still unknown. We can't say definitively. Um, and there is still exposure to those um, chemicals and aerosols and, and heavy metals and so forth that we've already talked about. So the question remains, can ENDS help people quit? You'll, you'll hear, obviously, stories of, of people who know someone who quit. And, and sure, it may work for some people. That doesn't mean that it's going to ultimately be approved or recommended. Um, you can see in the, this ad that's highlighted here kind of kind of shows this, but um, ends even if they're not formally marketed as a cessation device because that would um, you know create a whole new set of legal considerations, they are being more or less promoted as such. Um, they're even being promoted for weight loss and other things like that, you know, the healthy alternative to cigarettes. So, so they are being presented in a positive um, light in that way. But again, this is all unknown. And it's also unknown whether or not they can help people quit. So there's been some research on this. Again, none of these are long-term studies. It's, it's hard to, to make any sort of um, strong takeaway from that. So I apologize if you're coming here today hoping for something of that nature. We just don't have the evidence to, to make strong conclusions. Uh, studies have been mixed as to whether or not they might work. Um, you can see that 85% of users report using um, ENDS for cessation, and 11% reported quitting, and, and that's in one study anyway. Um, you can see another study found e-cigarette users had a higher quit rate than those who were using NRT. However, there's all sorts of selection biases that may come into play here. Um, people who are going to this route may be very motivated to quit um, than the average person. Perhaps they're even able to use ENDS to, to modify their nicotine intake. Um, so it, it takes a lot of evidence and a lot of time to really build conclusions. On the other side, we see that quitline callers using ENDS were less likely to quit smoking than non-users. Um, you know, if that addiction is, is to nicotine is still in place, then it's going to be obviously harder to, to stop smoking, even with ENDS. Um, and many studies found no difference in quit rates between e-cigarettes and NRT. So with NRT, nicotine replacement therapy still being... FDA approved and you know, having a lot more research and studies done on it, that's um, obviously the better alternative. Um, also, another part about uh, ENDS that we need to remember is that it does reinforce and perpetuate that hand to mouth ritual, which can make it all the more difficult to quit smoking and, and all the more likely that people could move back and forth. Um, so nicotine remains in these products and we're seeing a lot of dual usage. So um, we, we still have a lot to learn is the biggest takeaway. Are there benefits to, to decreasing cigarette use? Unfortunately, it is very difficult to achieve a significant benefit strictly through reduction. And, and that is one of the problems with e-cigarettes or ENDS because if people are using ENDS, they're you know, going to be addicted to nicotine, and that's going to make them more likely to use even a little bit of cigarettes, perhaps when it's convenient or, or what have you. And um, we know that even smoking one cigarette is, is unfortunately very risky. Uh, you can see that one study found to achieve a 42% reduction ex in exposure to carcinogens, users needed to reduce the number of cigarettes smoked by about 90%. Clearly, reducing by 90% is a very difficult thing to do. Um, it, it's hard to cut back that much. It, it would be better simply to quit, obviously. Um, many people may think it's okay to reduce, but we're, we're really seeing more and more evidence that um, there is no safe amount of cigarettes. There was a study that came out, I believe earlier this year, that found the, the relative risk of getting lung cancer was, was, well, if you smoked one cigarette, it was closer to that of someone who smoked, you know, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember exactly, but if you smoked one cigarette, your relative risk for developing lung cancer was closer to someone who smoked 
like a half a pack or a pack a day than if you smoke zero. So really zero cigarettes is the only safe number. Um, and, and with respect to this 90% reduction, you can see there that only one to 15% of ENDS users who continued to smoke were able to reduce their cigarette use by 90%. Obviously that's a very challenging thing to do. So as we're weighing the benefits and the risks, um, some of the benefits of, of trying to use ENDS as a, as a cessation device is the potential for harm reduction to the user. But again, um, they would have to very, very greatly reduce their cigarette use, and, and even that may not be enough. It really would be best to just eliminate the cigarettes altogether in order to achieve this. Um, that being said, the risks on the flip side is that we don't have the strong enough evidence to say this definitively. There are unknown health risks uh, related to long-term use. Um, there is a reduction of secondhand smoke exposure. Um, we do see that secondhand vapor uh, contains nicotine and other chemicals. Um, however, it, it is generally believed to be safer than traditional cigarette use, but short and long-term risk is still unknown. Um, the possibility of cessation remains a benefit if the person truly is able to use ends to um, quit smoking altogether and hopefully quit ends use as well. Um, but in the meantime, we're prolonging nicotine addiction. We're creating the opportunity for addiction in youth, which really is the greatest concern of all. We're renormalizing smoking behavior. Um, it's becoming more normalized to, to vape, as it's usually called um, in youth populations. And that really is the biggest concern of all, as I'm hopefully making clear. So as we're, you know, as public health professionals or clinicians or, or what have you, how do we address ENDS usage? Because it is challenging. Um, you know, there may be benefits here. There, like, there almost definitely are benefits over cigarette use, but you know, we have to be conscientious in our messaging. And as I'm going to highlight, it's really important to send different messages to different groups. So I want to quickly highlight the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine report, which came out in January 2008 as a major report. And I uh, strongly encourage you to um, look through at least the, the, the beginning parts of it. It does a good job of summarizing some of the evidence that's been found. Um, here are some of the conclusive evidence that most ENDS uh, products feature, and that is that they mostly contain and emit uh, numerous potential toxins, they, they increase airborne particulate matter in nicotine and indoor environments and are highly variable in nicotine delivery. It can be um, much higher in, in some of the, the products, such as Juul's, which are particularly high than some of the other um, products. And the important caveat is that completely substituting ends for cigarettes reduces exposure to toxins and carcinogens. And as we kind of talked about on one of the preceding slides recently, it, it's really challenging for people to completely eliminate cigarette use when they are uh, using ENDS. We do see those high dual use uh, rates, especially among older people. Um, so it's, uh, I, I definitely encourage you to look at this report. There's some other good findings and some good thoughts about kind of the overall public health impact and trying to weigh that. So as we're talking about interventions, I kind of wanted to present um, this for comparison, so this is kind of the traditional tobacco or, or cigarette cessation model. So the five A's, ask, advise, assess, assist, arrange for tobacco cessation intervention. Um, and so we definitely encourage that as you're using this to incorporate ENDS as, as a prominent uh, component in the ask part. Want to make sure we're asking about people's ENDS use, uh, not being very clear is that when we're finding out if someone is tobacco dependent, we're capturing that. We don't want to only ask them about cigarettes because that's not going to capture it. Um, also, you'd want to know the, the level of ends use when you're doing the assess and the assist pieces. So let's compare this to how to address ends use in a, you know, in a, in a similar way. Um, we also, also obviously we want to ask about ends use. Um, we want to advise people to quit using um, take advantage of counseling and FDA approved medications. Um, important to ask if they have tried using uh, NRT yet and other approved mechanisms, finding out if they've used it properly, perhaps they didn't use the products in the right manner, which 
we see very often, so it's important to talk through that. Um, we do want to listen, acknowledge their experience, find out why they're using ENDS. For some people, maybe it makes sense, and, and we don't want to close our minds to that. However, we do want to educate and address misconceptions, you know, making sure that they know it's not uh, safe, that we have a lot to learn, that um, it is aerosols as opposed to vapors, uh, things like that. And obviously, we want to refer them to the quit line and other sources that are appropriate to try to get them to quit. So here are some general messages to communicate across all groups, and then I'm gonna look at a few uh, specific groups. But um, general message to, to communicate is that uh, e-cigarette vapor may be less toxic than cigarette smoke, but the products are unregulated. They, well, they, there's some regulation now that it's being implemented, but they, contain, they may contain low levels of toxic chemicals and have not been proven to be effective as cessation devices. We just don't know the risks. And, and even if they are safer, that does not mean that they are altogether safe. Um, and they may not be helpful in, in quitting and, and may keep that addiction piece in, in, in uh, place. Um, another other messages is that smoking, even at reduced levels, causes increased health risks. So for people who are dual users, we want to make sure that they understand that there is risk, even if you're only smoking one cigarette. Um, it's important to set a quit date for ends use and not plan use indefinitely. Uh, that is our, our best tool to keep people off not only ends, but cigarettes long term. So kind of guiding them to, to view ends, even if it's not FDA approved, to view it as their own cessation device, if that's what they're determined to, to use as such. And um, we can scale down nicotine use that way. So here are the three distinct messages I want to highlight. Um, so the, the type of ENDS user really does drive the messaging. Um, and I want to highlight the, the long-term net public health effect uh, that the National Academy of Sciences report kind of underlines. There's really three factors in play. There's the long-term impact of youth cigarette initiation. How will that unfold over time? How will this normalization of, of ENDS ultimately drive cigarette use? And what effect will it have on adult cigarette cessation? Will it really be helpful in, in helping adults quit smoking? And what level of toxicity will we find in these products? And kind of the interplay of these three um, key factors will, will underline just what sort of benefit or, or harm ends might ultimately do in the long run. Uh, the concern really is the, the rise of youth use and the, the cigarette initiation greatly outweighing the benefit to the older adults who are able to quit. Um, so that, that's kind of what it's forecasted, but we'll see how it all plays out. Um, so we want to have different messages for the, the three groups I'm highlighting here, adults um, versus youth users, and also special messaging for pregnant women. And that's not to say that these are coverall messages, but I, I think they're good um, frameworks anyway. So adult messaging, um, most adult ENDS users also use cigarettes. So if that's the case, we really want to point out that um, Using continuing to use cigarettes at any level really is harmful and damaging. And some key messages we want to, to send here to this audience is that ENDS are not an FDA approved cessation device, and other uh, methods may be better, uh, are better. Um, ENDS usage is not harmless, even if it is less harmful. Um, and using ENDS exclusively is preferable to smoking cigarettes. We really want to highlight that only using ENDS, not using both ENDS and cigarettes, is really important. That being said, we don't know about the long-term impacts and there still is a risk of secondhand smoke exposure. And so you want to be mindful of, of vaping around children and, and situations like that indoors. Uh, for pregnant women, we want to um, send a very clear message that it's, it's strongly advised not to use any sort of um, products with nicotine during pregnancy. Uh, nicotine exposure during pregnancy is harmful. Uh, it can be harmful. Um, it can be toxic to developing fetuses. It can have impacts on birth outcomes and, and healthy deliveries and delivery itself. And as I've kind of highlighted, there are possible cognitive effects and learning disabilities that can continue to be a risk um, through, throughout development all the way up to about age 25, again, when the brain um, tends to be fully developed. Uh, so um, for, for pregnant women, we really do want to steer them off of ENDS and even NRT. Um, they really 
would only be used as an absolute last, last resort if someone really can't quit smoking. Um, so now let's turn to youth messaging. Uh, and we want to be clear here that ENDS are not recommended for youth usage under any circumstances. Again, this can have um, the possibility of developmental impairment, the addiction to nicotine uh, formulating, ultimately leading people to cigarettes. Uh, we want to make sure that youth do understand that ENDS contain nicotine, that they are addicting. So many of them do not realize that. I've, I've heard many firsthand stories of that. Um, we want to make sure that they know that they're not safe. They do contain toxins, and um, you know, just really underline that that there are long-term risks, and we just don't know uh, how this may unfold over time. So let's uh, turn to another component that I want to address quickly, and then we'll uh, have some case studies at the end to consider. Um, but let's look at some policy considerations related to ends because ENDS do need to be included in all policies related to clean air and, and you know, tobacco-free policies. Um, this, is, this ENDS you know, segment of the population has grown quickly and we need to respond as quickly and make sure that we're updating all of our policies accordingly. There's kind of three key components I wanna highlight as options. You can regulate the sale of products, you know, increasing ages to buy, making them less difficult to buy. Um, perhaps getting rid of some of the flavors that are out there. You can regulate the marketing, kind of the, the types of messaging that appear, where they appear, um, who's seeing them, and so forth. And you can regulate use um, with new or existing smoke-free laws, modifying laws, um, having organizational tobacco-free policies. Uh, we need to make sure we're including ends in any sort of clean air um, policies that we create. It, it can be very hard to, to accomplish some of this with products like Jules being so discreet. So we really need to be um, careful in our, in our framing and how we're enforcing these things. Uh, we do recommend using the ENDS term so that there's no ambiguity and we're covering all the different products that are out there. Um, just saying e-cigarettes might allow something to slip through the cracks. So we want to, as I've been saying, include ENDS in tobacco-free laws of, of all kinds. Um, we know that ENDS can be a trigger to smoking, um, and moreover, they can decrease someone's motivation to quit, especially because they're you know, keeping that level of tobacco dependence in place. Um, another big concern is the social norms around smoking and vaping behaviors. Uh, the danger of normalization is real. It, it may, in time, could renormalize cigarettes or lower the stigma around cigarettes to some extent, we just don't know. Um, there may be more normalization of marijuana as well as it can be you know, modified or in uh, these different vaping products and devices. Um, and you know, marijuana smoke also has carcinogens similar uh, to tobacco smoke and can also, can also impact people who are um, from a developmental standpoint as well. And um, ENDS present enforcement challenges to tobacco-free laws and policies for all these reasons we've talked about. They're harder to spot. Um, people may claim ignorance. They're easier to hide these devices. Uh, language has to be very specific. And um, because the health and safety risks are unknown, we need to protect um, you know, everyone else who might be exposed as well. So FDA regulation is unfolding. There was a law passed, um, FDA rule passed in 2016. And you can see that that came fairly late in the game. We had a lot of uh, kind of free, uh, free range to some extent in this industry for a long time. That's starting to be normalized now, which um, may lead to less small products and less, um, you know, safer products overall. Um, however, it also may empower some of the big tobacco companies to really uh, get their grip on, on this market. Um, the new rule did ban the sale of N cigars, pipe tobacco, and other products to people under 18 and required warning statements as well. Um, requires manufacturers to register uh, their products with the FDA. And um, importantly, ends were deemed a tobacco product um, as a result of this regulation, which, you know, kind of gave the FDA the, the initiative or the, the mandate to be able to address this. There is, in some cases, a compliance period, which can be as long as 18 to 36 months. 
So it's going to take time for all of this to unfold, as it has with the cigarette industry. Um, but regulation is beginning. It just will take some time. Um, obviously, here are some, uh, we, I've talked about including ends in tobacco free policies. So here's kind of a model language that you can use to do that. E-cigarettes, electronic vaping devices, personal vaporizers, electronic nicotine delivery systems, or such devices which deliver nicotine or other substances to a person inhaling from the device. So that is you know, one example of a, a comprehensive coverall um, phrasing that could be used for um, you know, in including this in our policy. So I, I've come to the end of the didactic part. I, I do want to get to the, the case studies and, and any questions in the last 10 minutes here. So a few takeaways um, is that, well, it, it's hard to have a really clear, straightforward message about um, ends, whether or not they're recommended or not. It really does depend on the audience. We can say that for, for youth and for kids and pregnant women that they are not recommended under any circumstances and may lead to addiction and cigarette use, which really is the greatest concern. Um, I also wanna highlight again that we just don't know what long-term use will look like. Um, I also want to, to point out that they may be um, a better solution if people who are long-time smokers are able, and older uh, adults are able to switch entirely to ends. Uh, it's quite likely that they can experience a benefit from that way. And um, I do want to underline again that really the, the biggest risk is the addiction and the crossover to, to cigarettes. It's not so much the, the risk of acute exposure from you know, an exploding device or a, a leaking of the e-solution or drinking the e-solution. These things do happen, um, but they're very, they're rare and they're not our primary concern. Our primary concern is nicotine addiction and, and cigarette use. So now let's look at the case studies. So this is an opportunity um, for, for audience uh, participation. We have, a, uh, we have a pretty small audience, so it should be pretty easy to manage if, if you'd like to participate. Um, there's some features on, on the right that you can access. There's a hand raise feature, there's a, a um, chat feature, and we can unmute people who'd like to participate. So I'll start by um, reading practice case study one, and you'll see the example, and then there's a few questions and we can kind of discuss as best we can. So practice case study number one. Ashley is a 44-year-old female who has been a cigarette smoker for about 25 years. She recently started using ENDS as a means to cut back on her cigarette use. Using ENDS to help limit her cigarettes, Ashley has cut back from a pack of cigarettes per day to about a half pack per day. So the, the questions I, I wanna pose for discussion is what information would you share with Ashley and what advice might you suggest? And uh, there's only a few of us, so don't be shy. Please um, let us know, you can use the, the hand raise feature or type in the chat box and I'll unmute you. Um, maybe I'll even try unmuting everyone if, if no one responds. Anybody? Derek, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I hear someone. <laughs> it's Dennis Bloomquist. Hi, Dennis. How are you? Hey, how are you? Doing great, thanks. Nice presentation. Really uh, encapsulates uh, pretty much anything we would want to know or need to know about the topic or subject. Um, but uh, it, it also validated what I suspected pretty much from the get-go. Uh, I didn't hear anything that conflicted with what I already believed and experienced with, uh, with clients. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say in this particular case study, uh, when someone gets down around 10, I recommend that they start thinking very seriously about setting their quit date. I don't mm -hmm. really necessarily recommend that before they get to around 10. And if they get to five, I expect that they can set their quit date. It's totally up to them, of course, but I strongly encourage them to go ahead and, and really set a quit date if they get down around five. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great example of kind of realistic goal setting. You, you know, as you're saying, it's hard to jump from you know a pack or even a half 
pack a day just straight quitting. And we see that reflected in the cessation rates. But, but yeah, um, helping someone in that way would definitely be a great approach. Um, thank you very much. Sure. And I've also found that people tend to sort of hit a barrier at around a half a pack at around 10 a day and have a hard time really cutting down much after that. Some people can go ahead and go down to four or five a day, but generally a lot of people find that they just want to go ahead and quit at that point when they get to 10. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very true. Thank you. And that makes a lot of sense. And, um, I also see we have a comment from Lois that she would share with Ashley that um, ENDS are not FDA approved and we don't know what the exact effects or harm are. And that's a, a very good point as, as well. Um, perhaps Ashley could try using an NRT approved device in order to help her cut back further, um, kind of in the nature that Dennis is describing. And uh, another thing that I would point out is we have great motivation here. Ashley's interested in quitting, so um, we definitely have captive audience that we could really uh, try to help her to take that final step. Okay, thank, thank you both for your great uh, participation. I have one more kind of different looking practice case study that let's uh, talk about here. So, uh, Mark is an 18 year old male in his final semester of high school. He began using ENDS about two years ago and admits that he has started to use them more frequently over time. Mark has only very rarely smoked cigarettes in certain social settings and says his ends use is under control. So same type of questions to the audience. Um, what information might you share with Mark and what advice would be worth suggesting? Any thoughts? And everyone has been unmuted, so if um, if you're ready to talk, just go for it. <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll get the ball rolling a little bit and maybe we can build off of that. Um, what, one thing that I would want to, to talk to Mark about and, and really highlight is the, the danger of that cigarette use and, and the reality that he um, may or may not be aware of that he is increasing his tobacco dependence and, and you know, addiction or risk of addiction to nicotine. We really would want to talk to him about the danger of any level of cigarette use being, um, you know, greatly increasing his, his risk. And, and perhaps uh, he's even underreporting how often he does smoke cigarettes. We'd really want to caution that. Any other thoughts about this? There's another big piece of this that I would probably want to mention. Well, you probably have the numbers on this, Derek, but uh, my understanding is that tobacco users, smokers in particular, chronically underreport, uh, yeah. underestimate their usage. Do you have any numbers on that? Um, not off the top of my head, but that's a really uh, interesting question. I'll dig deeper on that one if we have any straightforward statistics on reporting versus underreporting. That may be a hard thing to quantify, but. But I'll do some digging on that and get back to you. So, so right from the get-go, I ask people how much they're smoking. And I, one of the things I expect them to do is actually count how many cigarettes they smoke. So then you get people who have these various entry methods, and that just muddies the water. And it's very difficult to quantify how much nicotine they're actually getting. Yeah, that's a great idea. I mean, if, if people aren't counting, it's very likely they're going to underreport, even if it's subconscious. And and you make another great point that it's really hard to quantify, you know, how much nicotine you're getting in, in different ends products because they do vary so greatly. Um, another part that I would want to address with Mark, and this would be something that would need to be done delicately, um, but I would want to let him know that. Um, there is the possibility of some impairment from, from nicotine exposure and, the, and that even if he were to only use ENDS, he would still be um, submitting himself to that risk. So any, any last comments or thoughts on either one of these practice case studies? All right, I'm gonna move forward to the, the close here. 
Um, I do want to point out that the National Behavioral Health Network for Tobacco and Cancer Control um, is among our partners, and they have a lot of great resources on this topic and other smoking topics. So um, I encourage you to check them out if you haven't. And lastly, um, here is our generic contact information. If you have a question specific for me, you can reach me at um, same number except for 3714. Um, so you're, you're welcome to call me directly. Um, that's our, our company email, and all of you have my personal email, so feel free to contact me any questions um, or follow up thoughts. And before we close, um, I will note that we're intending to post this uh, video before too long, and we will let everyone know when that is available. And any last questions um, before we wrap up today? Okay, well, if there's no questions, then I, I thank you all for, for your attention and the great participation in the case studies. And I, I hope this has been helpful and um, wish you continued luck in, in working with uh, people around tobacco and end cessation. Thank Very good, you thank you, Derek. You're quite welcome, thanks. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome.